So welcome everyone. Today we are pleased to welcome uh, Kobana Boen from uh, Stanford University. Uh, he's um, a professor of bioengineering and uh, computer science, um, in association with the departments of neuroscience. Uh, he has been a pioneer in neuromorphic engineering, uh, credited from uh, Caltech in uh, electrical engineering, one of the uh, uh, original students of Carvermead. And today is going to talk about uh, 3D stackings uh, for neuromorphic engineering, uh, some of the, the issues related to uh, stacking processes together and uh, some of its uh, solutions. So without further ado, like please Kobana, we're like listening. All right, uh, yeah, uh, nice to be here and great to see a lot of familiar faces. Let me go into presentation mode. And I presume you can see my slides, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this talk is gonna be about scaling and I'm gonna start by looking at how deep neural networks have scaled. And one of the uh, most uh, popular examples is GPT-3. And as the name implies, this is the third in the series, GPT-1, which was introduced in 2018, had 117 million parameters and was a stack of what I call these decoder layers, 12 of those. And the signals that were passing back and forth between these layers, which is called the model dimensionality, were 768. And so in 2019, a year later, you now were stacking 48 of these decoder layers or transformer decoder layers, the full name. And you were sending 1600 signals between them. And the number of parameters in the model or weights was now 1.5 billion. And now uh, we are 2022, so this was two years ago. So um, we had now 96 of these uh, decoder layers, 12,000 signals going back and forth for uh, parameters 175 billion. So we've gone with a eightfold increase in decoders or height of the stack or depth of the network to 96. We've, we've widened uh, the, uh, the, the network 16 fold to 12,000 dimensions and parameters have increased, increased 1500 fold to 175 billion, which is no longer the state of the art. You know, people are pushing uh, a couple hundred uh, billion weights. And so why are we doing this? Uh, <laughs> you know, is this really paying off? Of course, it's, yeah, we're doing it because it's paying off, but it really takes, you know, scaling is really hugely important because you need this kind of increase in size to see, to make progress basically. And the way you can see that is if you plot error, which is really cross entropy loss, as a function of amount of compute that you perform to train one of these networks. And each of these curves you see in different colors correspond to models with 100,000 to 100 billion parameters. And so GPT-3 is up here in the 100 billion, 175 billion, and the predecessor GPT-2 at 1.5 billion or so is, is down here. And what you see in going from GPT to GPT-3 to compare these two curves, the number of weights increased 170, uh, 120 fold, and but data only increased five fold. And so then you ended up performing 570 fold, almost 600 fold more compute. And what that did was that it took you from this curve that's asymptot asymptoting right here and put you on this curve here that's asymptoting at a lower uh, cross entropy loss. And the sort of asymptote follows this dotted line here, which is going like flops to the minus 120th power, right? So if you take two to the 20, which is a million fold increase in parameters, and you take as the 120th power, you get a half, right? So to drop your error a factor of two, you need a million fold increase in compute. And this is why you're seeing this huge increase in compute. Um, so kind of like that's the bad news, but the good news is that it continues to pay off as, as they continue to do this. This power law is not, it's not stopping. So yeah, that's the good news. Okay, but now we're at a point where it takes like almost $5 million to train GPT-3. 
And basically this corresponds to like 10,000 GPUs running all out for two weeks. And this is just a snapshot at the present time. But if you look back in history, going back to a Terry's net talk, which got me excited about neural networks when I was an undergrad in Hopkins, you know, I was a freshman in 1985. And in those days, this was Lynette from Jan LeCun back in uh, 98 or so, or 99. And we were kind of limited by Moore's law. So these models were getting bigger in tandem with the doubling of transistors every two years. That's Moore's law. But all of a sudden, around 2012, maybe even starting in 2011, uh, these neural networks started to break you know, all these records. And that drew a lot of attention. And the thing that enabled this kind of jump here was GPU computing. And so it just turned out that, you know, if we just kept going and we had more computer, we could have been doing this back then in the 80s or 90s. But now we have GPUs and we are now on a curve where we're doubling the amount of compute every three and a half months. And for language models like Bear GPT-2, GPT-3 is doubling every two months. And obviously this is way faster than more slow. And so what that means, you have to use more nodes, more cores, you have to run longer and you're just burning more energy because what Moore's law was giving us before was more compute at a cheaper cost. You know, energy per flop was going down, but, you know, and so um, GPT-3, just to put this in context, releases as much CO2 as 1300 cars do in two weeks, okay? And if you look at, you know, the amount of energy Google's data centers are using over the last seven years, it's increased 3.6 fold, okay? And there's already a couple of percent of what the US <laughs> energy consumption is. So we are kind of like at this point where, you know, this is unsustainable on the one hand and it's an unequitable and basically, you know, ordinary folks like us, even some of the leading universities like Stanford are complaining that they can't compete. Okay, so, uh, and so even the ordinary guy who wants to have this kind of capability running on his phone, you know, uh, is something we call AI for all. Um, I think Fei Fei Li coined that term. And I like to use librarian in your pocket. You know, what I would like to do if I had access to all the information on the internet through GPT-3, which has read all these books and it's got the whole Wikipedia and it's got all kinds of, you know, things written about Picasso. I'd like to ask it interesting questions and have a conversation and learn, like I would talk to a librarian who will direct me to resources that are relevant and help me figure out what I'm looking for. And of course, this means that the compute has to be happening in a, not in batch mode, but just for you. And, you know, in the cloud, we're gonna batch this and you're not gonna get this. Uh, but even that, you know, so the user model, the user interface, and let me just list four important factors here that this kind of vision could, um, you know, enhance in ways in which this could enhance our lives. So it could save energy by offloading the data processing from the cloud to our phones, which you already have sitting around. Um, it could be personal, you know, basically it's what they call a batch size of one, not processing like a hundred different requests, you know, yeah, at once through the same model. It could be real time. We don't have to wait, you know, transmit the whole sentence and then wait, and then we get the translation and so forth back. Uh, and it could be secure. Right, our data stays on our own device and we don't have to, nobody can in intercept it as we are transmitting back and forth. And so question is how, what would it take to actually do this? What would it take to be able to run GPT-3 on your you know, smartphone and converse with it in real time and do this all day without you know, running out of juice? Uh, to do it in real time, you'd have to normal conversation rate, you'd have to, you need a 15 fold faster processor so that's, that's not too big of a challenge, but the bigger challenge is that you need a 174 bigger battery. Or if you want to think of it that way, the processor has to run 15 times faster, but it's energy efficiency, energy per operation has to go down so much like 174 so that it can use the current battery. And it's not clear now where this kind of gain in efficiency can come from. And so, this is really what the talk is about. And, um, and but it's, I'm gonna take a, a, a slightly different take than 
you know, us in the neuromorphic computing field have taken in the past. And, you know, I'll, I'll get to that later. But the take that I'm taking is really inspired by quantum supremacy or quantum computing. And the lesson from there is that, you know, what do they mean by supremacy? They mean if I do a computation and I use a lot less energy than you do, then my computer is supreme to yours. And they don't just care about, you know, okay, this task I'm doing better than you. They care about if I double the size of the task, you know, that's my energy I use, quadruple, quintuple, or does it just scale linearly, right? If you can lower that exponent, then you're more supreme, right? And it turns out that this is not determined by how clever your programmer is or, you know, progress in algorithms and so on and so forth. Yeah, that improves, but it hardly affects the exponent. And, you know, so this is why in computer science, we talk about MP not equal to P. I mean, so you can't turn an exponential exponentially hard problem into a polynomially easy problem. But this is exactly what quantum computers do. And the way they do this is they recognize the fact that it's the signal encodes, the way you represent information in the basic representation and the basic operations that you perform on those basic uh, representations that determine your supremacy, the exponent of the scale. And for instance, you can drop it from exponential to polynomial if you replace qubits replace bits, entanglement replace conjunction, and superposition replaces disjunction, right? This is what uh, Richard Feynman figured out in 1982 when he thought this class, physics of computation with Kava Mead and uh, John Hopfield. So kind of the birth of, you know, the deep neural networks, the neuromorphic computing, and the quantum computing all came out of this view. Uh, so that's very interesting. But, you know, now I, I, I don't think us neuromorphic guys have really looked at, you know, the, the approach that Feynman took to figuring out, you know, this is what's going to make the computer powerful. This is what's going to make it supreme. It's the codes and the operations. So that's the first thing you need to figure out. And he figured those out. And then the physicists knew what they need to build. And that's what they've been doing, trying to do since 1982. And, you know, I'm not kind of going to switch to building quantum computers because that's really hard. But I think um, we, can apply, we can learn from this framework, applying this framework to neuromorphic computing. So that's really kind of like the, the motivation or the way I want to frame this, this, uh, this talk. And so then the challenge then for us neuromorphic engineers or neuromorphic computing guys is to identify what are the right codes and what are the right operations, right? If we get those right, we should be able to prove that we are neurally supreme. Okay, we achieve neural supremacy. Okay, so now the challenge is that cognition arises from structures that span six spatial scales, like you see here on this axis, and operate at six temporal scales, like you see here on this axis. This is a spatial temporal version of Terry's famous uh, levels of investigation slide by Ali Vasiri. And so it's really hard to figure out, okay, what is the right, what is the right uh, abstraction here? At which level should we, you know, support those primitives or those representations and then ignore everything below that, okay? So the question is, what is the right level of abstraction? Which features can we, which features can we ignore and still preserve the brain's supremacy over computers? And so I'm gonna try and figure this out from first principles, okay? And so, and again, you know, feel free to ask questions or pop them in the chat. It's supposed to be a chalk talk, but, you know, I'm using slides, but we still want to maintain the informality of the chalk, chalk talk experience. That was the whole thing that's great about chalk talks. So, um, yeah, and um, somebody will have to read me the, um, somebody have to read me the, the, the questions or whatever, if, uh, one comes up or just speak up because um, I can't see you guys. Okay, so, 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 you know, the way I'm going to define the size of the task or the size of the network, you know, is in terms of number of neurons and the idea is that these neurons are arranged in layers and they are interconnected by synapses and they are M neurons wide in the, you know, M neurons in the layer and they are stacked L layers deep, right? And so I have a total of big M neurons given by L times little m, depth times width. 
And then I'm going to basically lay this out, right? And I'm going to then route all my wiring, whether it's feed forward, recurrent, residual, skip connections, and things like that. Okay, so these pebble guys tend to be non-sequential. They are going across several layers. And, and these uh, pink guys uh, local, okay? And then I'm going to, once I know the layout, I know how long my wires are and so forth, then just straight first principles allows me to compute how much energy it would take to do an inference, okay? And, um, and so the you know, first principles we're gonna use, uh, you know, that work equals force times distance, okay? Like you see here from Stickman physics, when you apply that to electricity, you know, the electrical signal you know, transmitting a signal along a wire does work proportional to the amount, the length of the wire. And this is analogous to filling a hose, okay? And that with water and then draining it, okay? And the water corresponds to charge on that wire and the volume corresponds to the capacitance of that wire. And so capacitance is proportional to the length of the wire. So basically the amount of water I have to put in is proportional to the length and then putting in water and draining it is, is the work you're doing per signal. Okay, and so that's why, you know, the energy for signaling goes like the length of the wires that you're signaling on. And so first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna sort of do this like we're doing right now with our neuromorphic chips where we're in 2D, we are building these crossbars, which is a way of taking all the outputs of a layer, multiplying them by a weight matrix, which is stored in these, you know, memory cells at the cross points between the, output wires of the previous layer, the wires bringing in the outputs of the previous layer, and the wires that are taking input to the next layer. And by so doing, you can basically perform a vector matrix multiplication. And so um, here I have a network which has, you know, 10 layers. Each one of them has 10 neurons, and that's a total of 100. And, you know, so I need a 10 by 10 crossbar you know, between each of these layers. And I need these longer wires that are running, allow a signal to get from any crossbar to any crossbar based to implement these residual skip feedback connections. And so those 10 are to be my longest wires because it's 10 times 10, okay? 10 crossbars times 10 copies of those crossbars, the length of 10 of those crossbars. And so, so now we can calculate how much work we are going to do when we send the signal. It's proportional to distance. Our longest distance is L times M, little m, and that's equal to big M, which is the total number of neurons. And then we have to calculate, you know, multiply that amount of work each signal does by the number of signals we send around, which assuming that scales like the number of neurons, then that's proportional to M. And so the total amount of work we're going to do is going to go like M squared, okay? So the energy is scaling like neuron squared, as you see here. So that's the bad news. The good news is that the area is also scaling like M squared, okay? And so it means that as we are generating heat proportional to M squared, because energy, you know, uh, gets converted to heat in these wires, electrical energy, our area that dissipates that heat is also growing at the same rate. And so, we can operate in parallel, all these M neurons can fire and everything will stay cool, it won't overheat, okay? Now, how can we beat that, you know, neuron squared scaling, all right? How can we improve that? Well, one way to do it is to take inspiration from, you know, Manhattan and, you know, exchange this suburban sprawl we have in Los Angeles for these skyscrapers we have in Manhattan, which shortens the commute that you have in Manhattan, right? And so that's less energy spent just moving back and forth and then more energy left over to do real work in your offices, right? So the same thing applies to building chips that compute. Okay, so if we stack those crossbars now, then what you see here on the right is the stack here. And we have our little m by little m crossbars and we have stacked L of them, right? And now, because L, the number of layers you have, you know, is typically like, you know, much less than the number of neurons in a layer, you know, so then the distance, this vertical distance is now negligible. And our signals have to travel just a distance proportional to little m. 
And we still have a total of M signals. And now we have a choice, basically how we organize the neurons into layers, right? And supposing we start off, you know, but, but then our total energy is now little m times big M. And if we make little m proportional to the square root of M, that means the height of the network and the width of the network are scaling like the square root of the total number of neurons, which is reasonable. Um, but you can relax this and you can still, more rigorous arguments give you the same answer. But so um, I'm just keeping it simple here, you know, because, yeah. but anyway, so, so then, you know, little m times big M is now going like M to the three half spar. So now we have energy scaling like the three half spar of neurons. So this neuromorphic system, 3D neuromorphic system is supreme to the 2D one we saw before, right? And so, but then it has a problem. That's the good news for these guys. But there's bad news for these guys because the area that it has to dissipate heat, and remember the height is negligible. So most of the surface area is on the bottom and on the top. And that surface area is proportional to M squared. And M squared is proportional scales like M. So we have energy that we are dissipating like that's scaling like M to the three halves power and heat that we are trying, you know, we have to dissipate this energy. We're generating that energy. I want to dissipate this energy, otherwise you're going to overheat, you know, temperature is going to rise and we can't because, you know, the energy is increasing faster than the surface area that can dissipate. The heat is, is increasing faster. And so this basically has to operate serially. You can't actually run all these layers in parallel simultaneously. You can only run like one at a time, like they do in 3D memory. They just access one layer of that and so forth. And so the question is, you know, we know the brain is 3D and, you know, all the neurons all the time are firing in all these different areas. In parallel, it's not, we have never seen it operate sequentially. And so um, how do you solve this thermal problem? And again, if you go back to the Los Angeles sprawl versus the Manhattan, you know, skyscrapers, you'll notice that they don't let you drive your cars into Manhattan, right? They let you take the, the subway, right? Because the idea is that when they exchange these cars for trains, they can cut the smog because you're moving all these people with the same amount of smog that one of these cars is generating. And remember, like supposing we shorten the distances by a factor of 10 because we build these skyscrapers, Okay, and now people are traveling 10 times shorter, but the, and so they are cutting down the small, if they were driving their car, it's a factor of 10 per person. But now the area over which we are dissipating that smog is gone down a factor of 100, right? And so smog will be like 10 times more intense in Manhattan. Okay, so, so just shortening the distances alone is not enough, right? And so this is why, you know, you, they, they want you to use public transportation. You also have to shorten the amount, of <laughs> reduce, the, the smog per distance traveled, okay? Uh, per unit distance traveled. And so if you apply that principle to computing, what this translates into is that we need to pack more bits of information into each signal, okay? And that's like your subway car carrying, carrying more people. Okay, and so how many, so, so how much can we, basically first we have to figure out two, two things. We have to figure out, okay, so what's the minimum number of bits we need to transmit from one layer to the other? What's like a lower bound for that? And if we did that, could we reduce the, or could we reduce the signals? Is that lower bound of signals able to, you know, solve this thermal problem? Okay, and so, and so that's, we can answer that question by actually looking at, you know, how many different uh, subsets a um, deep neural network divides its data set into. Okay, and the idea is that, first of all, we take into account that the data set spans D dimensions locally. So for example, this is a data set that spans two dimensions locally, right? And so if I look at a piece of this data manifold, this D dimensional data manifold, you know, the way that neurons respond to data points in that space is that they put in this sort of decision plane and they are active for data points on one side of the plane and they are quiescent for data points on the other side. Okay, if you're interested, the you know, displacement of these planes is determined by the bias that the neuron has and the orientation is determined by the weights that the neuron has. And so if we form these neurons into D groups, in this case, three groups with similarly oriented planes, 
Okay, then we have these three groups. We've got group one, which are these horizontal planes, and then we've got, you know, group two, one set of vertical planes, and the other one, so forth, right? And so then with this arrangement, we can figure out how many subsets we're going to divide the data set into. And it goes like n plus one, because, you know, like when we have three guys, we divided that into four, four slices. And then in each dimension, so that raised to the D, right? And so, for example, in this actual example, you could count, you get 80 subsets. Okay, so then this gives us an idea what, how many signals we actually have to send from layer to layer, because assuming that this is the resolution, you know, we want to be able to identify each of these subsets, then we have to send enough bits to count that many unique uh, subsets, okay? And, but we're not gonna use bits. We're gonna use something called an NRE signal, okay? So a bit will be a two RE signal, n equal to two. But because we have groups of neurons that have like four or three or so forth, then N will refer to the number of neurons in the group. And when one of those neurons signals, it can communicate one of N symbols, okay? And so, for example, you know, group one here, this first group here and group two and group three could communicate one of three signal symbols, one of four and one of three. And if we allow just one signal per group, right? Because remember, we're trying to be sparse. <laughs> okay, and like you see here, then these would be these D NRE signals, as they would be called, represent a base N number with D digits. Okay, you can think of the neuron that's signaling is telling you what that digit symbol is and, and the group from which that neuron is, in which that neuron is, is telling you the place of that digit, right? Which has that symbol, symbol, right? And so, and so if you actually, uh, for in this case, for example, we'll be sending a number 313, three, right? This is three and this is one and that one is also three. And so, um, and so now these numbers enumerate n plus one to the d subsets, just like we want them to, right? And in this case, I'm assuming if a group is silent, that means the symbol is zero. So that's how I get the plus one in here, right? And if you do the math again, then this, this representation, NRA representation can actually give us just with three spikes, tell us any of these subsets in which a data set, a data point actually falls into. Okay, so that's an estimate of the lower bound of signals that we have to transmit from layer to layer, okay, to preserve this information. And so now if we include this NRE signaling with this stacking, okay, how does it come out? How much energy now do we need per inference, okay? So we are doing that again. Now the work we're gonna do, right, is proportional to distance again, which is still M, okay? And which goes like m to the big M to the half power. And the signals we have, remember now we have a constant number of signals in each layer. We have these D NRE signals, and D is the intrinsic dimensionality of the data set. So that doesn't change, right? And so it, we have D signals in each layer, and we have L layers. And so the number of signals is proportional to L, which is again going like M to the half, like we said earlier. And so multiplying those two together, we see that our energy scales like the number of neurons, okay? So we achieve this linear scaling of energy with neurons. And will this thing overheat or not, right? Well, for that, we have to look at the area, which is still going like little m squared. So that's also proportional to m, right? We figured that, that, that out earlier. And so now energy is proportional to area, so heat can dissipate and we can operate in parallel, okay? So this ties it all together. If you want to achieve this linear scaling, this is how you do it. Now I'm going to show you the, so what are the implications of this? Okay, so there's two main implications. The first one is that we've replaced N signals in the layer or actually literal M signals in the layer, like all the neurons signaling with a fixed number of, of signals like D, right? And so how does D compare to M? You know, we reduced, reduce D is much smaller, then we can save a lot of energy right there. 
Okay, and then the next thing is that, you know, because we're stacking and we've got these shorter distances, we are also doing, you know, work that goes just like the number of neurons in the layer, okay? So let's look at what D, how D compares to little m. And then let's look at the overall, I'm gonna summarize these three different architectures, compare them, and then actually compare them with the human brain as well. Oh, mammalian brain. Okay, so we started with GPT-3. It's got these 12,000 neurons. Those correspond to the dimensionality of the model. They are actually the dimensionality of the embedding vectors, if you, you are familiar with, with this, this uh, GPT-3. And it turns out that when people have looked, um, the intrinsic dimensionality, like if you look at where these points that represent words are sitting in this 12,000 dimensional space, you know, they sit on a 10 dimensional manifold. Okay, for like BERT, it's like six dimensional. It's like surprisingly low, okay? And you see similar, similar trends in ImageNet, right? You know, ImageNet gets, you know, the ambient dimension, you know, how many pixels are in an image is 150,000. But if you then measure the intrinsic dimensionality of like where all these, where these images are sitting, <laughs> uh, it's about 35. Okay, so that's another kind of like 3,000 fold reduction. And this one was like a thousand fold reduction. So if we can basically go from thousands of tens of thousands of signals to tens of signals like 35 or 10, that's equivalent to reducing energy consumption from kilowatts to watts. And so something that was running on a data center can now run on your phone. Okay. So that's the, the, uh, the just sparsifying, and that's what the sparsity can buy you. And okay, now let's compare what this scaling we are achieving of energy versus neurons. Let's compare that with the brain, right? If we match the brain, then we've achieved neural supremacy. If not, we still have ways to go. Okay, so here it goes. Okay, so we started with a 2D you know, neuromorphic chip with binary signaling, okay? basically like half the neurons are signaling. And this is typically what you get if you use a rel U, you know, half your neurons will be active. And then we went to 3D, but we still kept the binary signaling. We got a one and a half power of energy versus neurons, okay? And then we finally went with 3D and this energy coding, right, or signaling. And that gave us a linear slope. And so now this is the data from the biology, right? And this is, uh, this is actually, she's published several papers on this, but I'm showing you this book that I highly recommend because it talks about all different kinds of neural supremacy. And if we have time, we can talk about which version of neural supremacy it is. This is, but, but you know, and let me just tell you what you're looking at here. So you're looking at like a rodent with maybe like, you know, 40, 30 million neurons all the way to humans with like a hundred billion because this is in millions of neurons, and the energy goes linear in the number of neurons. So that exponent one is, if you match that, then you've achieved neural supremacy, okay? So we know how to basically achieve neural supremacy. I'm giving you the recipe here, okay? And the key here is you have to have 3D, so you can stack these layers and really shorting the wires that are running around, but then when you stack layers, you reduce the area you have for dissipating heat. And so you have to have very sparse activity in each layer in this case, you know, on the order of a constant number of neurons are signaling, even as you increase the linear dimensions, there's always just D signal. So it's getting sparser and sparser as you're building a bigger and bigger brain. Okay, so we can get more into other things that this predicts about, about the brain later, but I want to then, put this into the larger context, right? So we started talking about net talk from, from um, the 80s. And, and over the last kind of 60, 80 years, uh, you know, conception of how the brain computes has evolved, right? And um, what we have, we, you know, we started with this sort of what I call the synaptocentric conception, right? And this means that, you know, the emphasis is on the synaptic weights, right? that's where you, you know you are getting your power from and the way what you do is you weigh these inputs you sum them you try out the negative part and you send the 
you know, if you send it the result if it's positive. And, um, and this is basically what your ReLU does. And this weighting operation is like aggregating spatially all your inputs. And, you know, it turns out GPUs, TPUs are terrific at doing this, this stuff, that kind of vector matrix multiplies involved in doing this aggregation, right? And neuromorphic guys basically said, no, but the brain, you know, it uses spikes, right? And, you know, it's true, the dendrite is all this analog stuff, but once you get to the somer, then you generate these digital like all or nothing spikes. And so people are claiming, okay, we should encode information spike rate or spike timing and so forth. And we should take into account, if we're gonna to try to estimate the rate, we have to integrate over time to see how many spikes we got per unit time and so forth. So that's like the decoding operation. And you know, I and many others have built neuromorphic chips with this mixed analog and the digital, stuff, digital side of things and digital spiking or address events on the, on the um, you know, axon side of things. So I call this axocentric, okay? And I'm now proposing a third conception, okay? And during the last 20 years, starting in 2000, you know, our eyes, our eyes started to be open to like how powerful or how complex or how interesting dendrites are, right? And they're not just this passive summation sum of WIJ, XJ over the whole dendritic tree. You know, it's not, that's not what a dendrite does at all, right? And it turns out in the next part of the talk, I'm gonna go into the biological side of things. It turns out that uh, with all these active channels that dendrites have, they actually in a good, they, they, they have the substrate to be able to decode the rank of a spike in a sequence or to be sensitive to a spike, you know, a particular sequence of spikes on a segment of dendrite. And so they are sort of parsing this sequence spatial temporally to decide whether they like it or not, okay? And this is the kind of representation that matches up nicely with these NRA coding that I've described that solves the PEMO problem. And I think if you're gonna build things in 3D, you have to go this route, okay? And so just to remind you, I told you that we can take our neurons, similarly oriented, you know, uh, planes, we group them together, and then we have, oh, sorry, let's go back for a second. Oh, yeah, sorry, let me blow it up, yeah. Okay, I missed it again, <laughs> okay. But, uh, let's should do, be more patient here, okay. And that's a problem with builds. I could jump out, but I think I'll get it this time. Okay, yeah, stop. Okay, yeah, so I told you that we're gonna have a spike in this group, a spike in that group, and a spike in this group, right? And in that case, you're gonna have to pay attention to which group the spike came from to tell that this was in the first place of the digit of the number, this was in the second place, and this was in the third place. But now if you actually impose, you can use time to say, okay, the spike, this group always spikes first, this group spikes second, and this group spikes third, and so just by looking at where the spike is in the sequence, which spike came first, you know, that's the first place digit and then the next place and so forth, right? So this is how I think the biology is actually presenting this, these NRA signals, right? And therefore now for a dendrite to sort of decode the information, it has to pay attention to the order because the order tells you the place of that uh, digit, okay? And so I'm gonna go through some evidence that uh, very short segments of dendrite are decoding interesting information, actually multimodal information. And that, and then I'm going to show you a computational model that takes all these active channels in the dendrite and builds, you know, uh, puts them together to be able to decode these kinds of sequence very selectively. And so it's making some predictions. This is a kind of like a whole, a novel uh, model. And it's making some predictions that we could go look for. Okay, but so the first example that um, dendrites, and the reason I'm going through this, I didn't give you the background, but you know, you know, people have generally thought like, uh, you know, Bartlett Mel and others, and even like data experiments from like, um, um, you know, Hauser, uh, have sort of thought of a branch, a whole branch of dendrites on about 100 micron level, 
you know, doing this kind of nonlinear thing, right? And you have this sigma pi kind of kind of uh, model. But here, what the latest data is showing is that very short segments of dendrite, you know, so like here, you're looking at this scale by five microns, and you're looking at a rat that's performing a delayed match to sample task, right? And so, and what you're doing is you're imaging calcium, and you are color coding the calcium signals depending on which whether they are more correlated with the delay, which will be green, they are correlated with the sample. These are the epochs in the trial, right? Sample epoch, which would be red, or the response epoch, which would be blue, right? And you interpolate in between them. And so that's what the colors mean here. And then the top row here is record doing this, basically scanning your laser along a basal dendrite branch, right? Or scanning it along one of the branches in the apical tuft. Okay, of a pyramidal cell. And so in this case here, you're seeing a lot of yellow. So there's like a lot of mixed responses to the, to the sample and the delay epochs of the trial. And then down here in the apical tuft, you're seeing, you know, uh, neighboring regions like in different combinations of the epochs of the trial. And, um, and then if you look at the trial type, there's also information in these calcium signals in pretty short segments of dendrite, like this would be like a 10 micron segment of dendrite, there's information that this is a right trial, right? And this is kind of a high level concept here, right? Because like, what did you cue them with? And you know, you have to remember that, right? And, and so forth. And then neighboring section here maybe is, is active when it's a left trial. So given this data, it's possible that even just along, you know, maybe like 30 microns of dendrite, you could say, okay, it's a left trial. Okay, I got the banana smell. Okay, I should suck on the on the left spout, right? It could all just happen <laughs> in this segment of dendrite. And this is, you know, really increasing the amount of power that these dendrites have, right? So, so this is kind of like the kind of power you get from this dendro dendrocentric conception. And so, so, so that's kind of like you know behaviorally relevant information is being decoded inside these short segments of dendrites. But you know, are they really listening to a sequence? Are they looking for a sequence? Well, we don't know for sure, but what we know is that if you actually go and look at how synapses become active here in these, this now is in slices, just spontaneous activity, you know, in uh, hippocampal slices, pyramidal cells, you see sort of the red guys here, these are four synapses that come on sequentially. And these purple guys are four, three synapses that come on sequentially. And this is like, you know, these are just traced out spines on a, on a dendrite. Okay, and there's other examples here. And this is the actual optical image here. And this is an example of what's called an in sequence. This one comes on, this one comes on, this one comes on, this one comes on. And these guys is an out sequence, right? And the way that they decide whether a signal a sequence is out or in, in towards the cell body, is they basically look at, okay, you know, which way is the location of the spine? And they look at the time and they fit it to a straight line. So if we get appreciable slope downward or upward, that means it's moving, you know, you know, it's it's moving outward or inward, right? And so this, this, this so there's evidence that over about 10 microns of dendrite, since these synapses are being activated, you know, two microns apart, you know, over 10 microns of dendrite, you could get a sequence of like five plus or minus two um, spines being activated sequentially. And so the question is that, yeah, so could they, you know, we all know that clustered synapses are more effective at driving this and they can engage these dendritic nonlinearities, but, you know, could the dendrites actually be looking at the actual order in which those things occur on, you know, kind of a few milliseconds time scale? And so this is a computational model that I put together, take into account these four different kinds of um, channels, um, active channels. Uh, AMPA is actually passive. And it's actually got a separate compartment for the spine head. It's got a spine neck. It's got the shaft. And you need all these. This is sort of the minimal model I could come up with <laughs> to, uh, to, do, to do this. And I'm, I'm going to explain what happens here. So, so the first spike opens AMPA channels. Like, so, you know, um, this is the current time here and this spike here has opened this amper channel here. And, uh, and then, you know, so that's what happens here. And then a little bit later is what we are looking at. But this, so this guy was open, but amper is open very briefly. 
and it depolarizes the spine, right? It, it depolarizes the spine, then that opens NMDA channels like you see here, and these are prolonged, so they are still on, right? And that even more strongly depolarizes the, sp the, the first spine and can establish a plateau potential. So these are known to occur in dendrites. And so now this, this segment here of dendrite has plateaued, right? And then the amplitude of this plateau potential is gonna decay as it spreads. Like basically the plateau happens in the spine head. It's gonna drop in amplitude as it goes through the spine neck. And, but then you've got these voltage sensitive channels, NAV, uh, sodium channels that can amplify it back up and counteract the drop across the neck and the decay across the shaft, okay? And so, so, but you know, once you pass the a setting, you know, once it decays, you know, once it decays below a certain drop threshold, it just drops because the sodium channels have a high threshold, right? And so eventually, but if enough of the, this next spine here is sufficiently depolarized, then these KIR channels that are sort of hyperpolarizing, hyperpolarizing and bypassing current out will be, will close. And so this prepares this spine here to receive the next spike, right? Because it's set up such that, you know, this first spine was special. He didn't have any KIR in with rectifying potassium. This guy has them. And so unless he's depolarizing, shut this thing off, AMPA can't overcome that KIR. And so, so, so now, but so, so the depolarization then shuts it off. And then now AMPA can come in just like here, depolarize this guy, recruit NMDA, and that can then, you know, give you a plateau potential. And then that will be amplified by the sodium. Uh, it would decay a bit, but, you know, by the next spine, this, this distance I predict in the models about four microns. You have to, within four microns, beyond four microns, it, it decays so much that you don't uh, shut off the KIR. And so if you were to deliver the next spike, not to this spine, but the one after that, KIR will just hypopolarize you and, the amper uh, current will be overwhelmed by that. Okay, so this is the idea. Okay, and I'm going to show you some some simulations here. Okay, so I built a whole uh, branch here with 20 of these guys. You're only showing like 10 here, and what you're seeing here is like as these spikes are coming in, you can get these plateaus. Okay, so like the first spike comes in, the first segment plateaus, and then it depolarizes the next one. This is what you're seeing when it goes up to here, it's depolarized. And then if a spike hits it, then it switches up there to the plateau and so forth. And this insert here is showing you the selectivity. If I just take this gray ridge and I zoom into here and I swap the order of these spikes, it was supposed to go sort of brown, purple, brown, purple, but these guys are swapped. And so this spike was supposed to come in here and this guy has been depolarized enough that that amper could have just made it go and plateau, but instead the spike here came into the next synapse after this, this location. So that's why, and this guy wasn't depolarized enough for that amper to turn on KIR. So it overwhelmed the amper here, okay? But now when the previous spine got its spike, this is the one that was moved later, it switches to plateau, it depolarizes this guy, but there's no spike to come and activate his amper. And so the plateau stops, okay? Just one swap. And, you know, if, um, but this, this swap is because I've spaced it just at the right distance. Like if, you know, we activate, you could activate, you could skip synapses shorter than that distance and it would still continue. So it's got some tolerance to swaps. Now in the last part of the, to uh, of, of, of the talk, I'm going to try and say, okay, how can we build this in a neuromorphic chip in particular in a 3D neuromorphic chip, right? And to make the connection between this model with all these biophysical details, as people know, you know, yeah, labs like mine have and others have implemented NMDA and all these Hodgkin actually like channels in silicon, but it takes a lot of transistors, it takes a lot of area. And so could we actually do this kind of thing in a nanoscale device, like inside a device? Okay, when we talk about like what is our basic operations that we're going to support. Right, we want to be able to support this kind of dendritic, what a segment or a stretch of dendrite does. And if we could do that in a device that would really uh, make this thing really um,
change the game, okay? Because doing it with like <laughs> seconds is, 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 takes a lot of area. So now, so, so what I've done here is that I've taken this model here and I have plotted the energy diagram for the model, basically how much electrical energy there is. And um, just like Hotfield showed that you can take a neural network or dynamical system and you can plot, you know, the apnoe function type of thing. Okay, and so this gives you some insight into how this kind of uh, sequence detection is working, right? What you see here is like, this would be the voltage at VK plus one, right? So, you know, just take these two spines here, the earlier one near the tip, that's his voltage is plotted in this direction. And the next one nearer the somer, his voltage is plotted in this direction. And then vertically in a 3D plot, we are plotting the energy, okay? And what you see here is that we've got three local minima. So we've got three equilibria, right? We've got an equilibrium where this VK here could be at rest, hyperpolarized. And VK plus one is also hyperpolarized. So that's what I call the rest rest uh, stable point. And in this case, you've increased VK. So this is where VK has plateaued, but VK plus one is still resting. And then here you've increased VK plus one. This is when they are both plateauing, okay? So if your upstream segment has plateaued, then for you to plateau, you just have to cross this tiny energy bar here from two to three. But if your upstream guy, VK has not plateaued, he's resting and you're also resting, then for you to get up there and plateau, you have to cross an uh, energy barrier that's three times higher. Okay, so the way this thing is working is that when you plateau the upstream neighbor, you really reduce the energy barrier for a spike coming in to plateau the next guy, okay? And so the idea now is like, can we actually do this in an electronic device? Like, can we arrange things like that, right? And so that is what we are proposing here. We haven't built any of this yet, <laughs> but um, you know, just uh, kind of, I'm showing you, I, I think this is the level at which we should be looking at abstracting the actual biology and you know, so that we can then do it much more compactly. So, so, so what I'm showing you here is these are what will be called ferroelectric capacitors. Okay, it's a capacitor whose insulator has electric dipoles in it. And these dipoles can point up if you apply a positive voltage across the capacitor, or they can point down if you apply a negative voltage across the capacitor. Okay, because dipoles, you know, the voltage induces an electric field and dipoles tend to align with the electric field. Okay, and so you can see here now, now then the idea is to place these capacitors close enough to each other, such that the dipoles here also tend to align with the dipoles in the next capacitor. In other words, the, 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 the fields they are generating kind of fringe over that distance. And, and so in that case, you, what you see here is that this red guy here, right? and is the guy that we've just flipped. And we've also flipped this guy, right? Like we gave this guy a positive pulse and he's sitting here, which corresponds to the positive polarization. And then we gave this guy also a positive pulse, he's sitting here, corresponds to the positive polarization. But you can see the energy well here. Now let's look at this guy here, right? He's sitting in the negative polarization, so the ball is on this side, right? But the barrier for him to flip, the barrier he has to overcome to come here, which will then be the positive polarization, is shallower than the barrier you normally have if you're sitting to a guy who's also pointing down, right? Because the fringe and fields from these upward pointing guys lowers the barrier for this guy to flip, okay? So this is exactly what we, we are seeing, in, like the energy diagram we saw in the dendrite, okay? And so, so that's the basic mechanism, just a string of capacitors like this can detect a sequence. Now, once you detect a sequence, you want to be able to sense that, you know, you detected a sequence, like the correct sequence of kid. And so for that, you can make these capacitors, the gate stack of a four electric transistor, okay? And this is something you have, you know, all your, your <laughs> You know, we, it's a normal transistor. People used to store memory and things like that because the, you know, pointing up and pointing down is like the bit is one, the bit is zero, right? And, and so if you flip all these guys up, you can lower the threshold voltage for the transistor and then it will start passing current. 
But when they are all flipped, when they are all pointed down, then the treasure voltage is high and doesn't pass any current. So the current flowing through this channel can signal that the sequence that came in was like gate one, gate two, gate three, gate four, gate five, right? And so it, its gates were activated, received pulses in the correct spatial temporal order. And then what you do now is like in 3D, you would have these, you know, dendrite, nanodendrites, and you'd have like, you know, these switches that you can use to route wires, you know, signals from cell bodies sitting on the bottom layer as not shown to a particular dendrite or dendrite segment in the right sequence that you want to detect. And when it passes current, that's then going to feed into another neuron and make it spike and so forth, right? And so this is kind of like the idea, okay? And this will have the and a recording and the, the SOMAS will then sort of, you know, in response to these currents, we'll find a particular sequence so that we encode the information as a sequence and the dendrites will then decode that. Okay, so, so that's basically it, okay? Um, in terms of where we are building this 3D stuff, uh, we are very early on, okay? But the inspiration for a lot of this is that the memory industry has actually Back in 20, 2007, you know, they said, forget 2D. It's really hard to make transistors this small. And, you know, so they basically released their first 3D memory chip in 2013. It had 24 layers. And this is in 2019, they had 92 layers. So they built the Manhattan skyline, basically, like you see here. You know, but because of this 3D thermal problem, they activate one layer at a time and nobody really knows how to sort of be able to compute in 3D memory in parallel. And what I've showed you here is that, you know, this kind of sparsity that this NRA signaling um, enables could potentially solve that problem. And the, and, you know, it's really inspired by the brain because it's 3D and it has to, it faces the same thermal problem. Okay, and so I was just going to indicate that we're here right now, but you know, I'm trying to get more people engaged here so we can basically leverage this progress the memory industry has done to build these 3D silicon brains. Okay, so that's the gang that has been up to all this over the last couple of years, and these are our funding sources, and it's been really a real pri privilege to develop these ideas with these brilliant students. And this is like a pictorial uh, summary of the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. So please feel free to ask questions directly or uh, you can write them on the chat and uh, I'll read them to, to go back. So anyone has a question? Don't be shy. <laughs> so I will start. Um, I was wondering if you have considered like uh, how glia might um, help um, the, the 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 model that you you were like uh, proposing with the spike rank. Do you think? Uh, do you have any idea like how like glia might uh, interact with these uh, spike ranking codes? Yeah, it's it's a good question. I think you know I'm by no means a glare expert, and uh, <laughs> um, but you know I think of the glare. Okay, so one of the big challenges of doing this, we 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 don't really have. We're kind of like at the point where Feynman was in 1982. Like he said, you know, you should be using qubits, you should use entanglement, and but he didn't have an algorithm for doing anything with a quantum computer. It wasn't until 94, 12 years later, that we had Shaw's. Um, algorithm for factoring, um, you know, numbers into large primes, and so um, you so so yeah so 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 we've identified that you have to represent the information this way, and you have to support this kind of uh, sequence detecting operation in the hardware as a basic primitive, and uh, but now how do you what's the algorithm like you know how do you wire up these things in the way that you want. And that's a very challenging problem because it's a combinatorial problem, right? You know, not only do you have to select which D of a bunch of neurons are going to fire, you also then have to, 
you take that sequence of D signals and wire it up to a nanodendrite in the in the in the correct order. All right. And so this um, and, so, and so what this means is that you know, of course, because it's combinatorial number of different ways in which you could wire it up, and there's also another material ways of ways you can choose the D out of the you know thousand or whatever neurons. You can't just wire everything up and then you know train it some weights, right? Because the, the space is huge, and so you have to have a way of actively you know remodeling the wiring, okay? Um, and neurons do this, tissue does this, right? You know, the, there's a very, the connections are very sparse and they're being pruned and new connections are being sprouted and so on. And it's likely that, you know, neurons that are looking for new guys to collect, to connect to are recapitulating some of the developmental processes that we see, which are quite well studied. And they are guided by these um, pathfinding molecules. They are, by, they are guided by these diffusible factors and things like that. And you know maybe the glare is responsible for some of this uh, signaling or mediating some of this. Okay, thanks. I have a question, Kwamina. Yes. Um, there was a lot in this, and uh, a little bit more than I can take in in one hour. And I'm wondering <laughs> if you have any of this written up in papers. Um, I have a, a manuscript that's gone through the first round of reviews. I just submitted the revisions. And so it's, uh, it's up to the reviewers how fast that's going to go from this point. <laughs> but okay. yes, I have a write-up, and it's, it's, uh, it, but it's not, yeah, it's under review. Okay. Hi, Kwebeno. Yeah, good to see you like after. Yeah, I just, <laughs> How are you doing? I had a, yeah, I'm doing good. Uh, yeah, I'm with Gert's group now. So I had just a basic question about like on your talk. So when you talked about like the NRE signals, the interconnects between different neurons, like how far like you're thinking of like those N could be, like it could then be used for like some bigger networks like the GPT-3 and Cypher-10 you were mentioning and um, like could they go to like 16 bit kind of activations like uh, apart from the like nano device structure that you are proposing and exploring is there like a reliable and a real case like interconnect bandwidth that can be achieved for the 3d compute and yeah, but and all, yeah. yeah finish sorry yeah, just like uh, just to add on that like on this transformer gpd3 kind of computations like it's not just about the weight and matrix, just not the matrix vector multiplication, right? Like you could have the vector vector multi multiplications mm -hmm. to where mm -hmm. you need a lot of uh, uh, interconnections between the cores if you want to mm -hmm. do the mm -hmm. entire layer of compute. So mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. those computations fit into this paradigm? Yeah, yeah. So um, it's a lot of questions. Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, but you know the point is. Um, I think the first question was, you know, is this going to be, you know, able to do something like GPT-3? Right. And I think that was about the scale of the, of the problem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is really why the memory 3D technology is the only way, because, you know, if you got an iPhone this year or last year, mm -hmm. 13 or Galaxy 10, you've got a terabyte of memory in your, in your mm -hmm. phone. And the reason why you have that is that these 3D memory chips, uh, flash chips, have a terabit, just one chip. And like I showed you in the picture of the Manhattan skyline, those skyscrapers are only eight microns tall. So one chip with a terabit of memory has 128 layers of memory cells and wiring. And they are using like 40 nanometer technology, but because they are 3D, they can achieve like a terabit. And then when you thin these chips down to like 10 microns and you, st you stack 10 of them, I mean, eight of them together, you get a terabyte. So that's just one package. Mm -hmm. And it, it's so small, it just slides into your thin iPhone. And so with a terabyte, you can fit 170 by 175 billion parameters with room mm -hmm. to spare, you know? <laughs> that's like a trillion, you know, bytes, right? And so, and so you already have right now the ability to store all of GPT-3's parameters Right. in your phone. And these 3D NAN cells, they can store 16 levels. They are storing four bits per cell. So it's already a, a four bit weight. 
right? And so, so, so it's just, if you actually do the calculation, there's number of memory cells under a square millimeter of, a, of just one of these 3D9 chips is 25 times the number of synapses under a square millimeter of cortex. So the density is even higher than in cortex, which is two millimeters thick. And, and, so, and so this is, if you, if you, yeah, if you want to scale, <laughs> they, they've scaled already, they can already do it. So, but the problem is the thermal thing and how can you compute in this and, memory? Everybody's talking computer mm -hmm. memory. And, and, uh, and so, so, but you know, if you just try to do your normal thing, so that's one. And, and so we've intentionally said, look, the sparsity is about the coding and yeah. eliminating, eliminating redundant signals and packing more bits. These are bits of information into each signal. And this NRA code gives you that, and it all sort of works out. But now you have to encode the information in these sequences, and you have to be able to decode that. So now you can't use you know, binary logic for that, because a logic gate, it doesn't care the order in which its inputs came on, are they high or low, right? And so this is why we are developing this new kind of device. Now, the second part of the question was like, you know, GPT-3 is, um, has this attention mechanism. And the attention mechanism is really doing inner products between, you know, when when some input comes in and better vector comes in, it projects into these subspaces and it gets a lower dimension, like 128 dimensional vector in GPT-3. So that 12,000 dimensional space, it projects into a 128 dimensional subspace. This makes sense because the data manifold is just 10 dimensional, mm -hmm. right? And so you project that subspace and you get, but they, they keep 128 components. So you get a 128 component vector they call like the, the key. And then they project another subspace, they get a 128 dimensional vector they call the value. Yeah. And you know they look at all the words in the text that came previously and each one has a key and value and they try to match up the keys and values, find the best. So there's a query for each word and then you, you match that up with all the keys and you return the value of the closest match. This is just an associative memory operation. It's just saying that, you know, because they do the soft marks, they don't just want to get a linear weighted combination of these values. They want to get the one that's closer, return that and suppress everything else. That's what the soft marks does. And so, but essentially what it comes down to is you want to have an operation that's much more sharply tuned than inner product. Right? The reason why you have to do the soft marks is that if you just take the inner weight of two, pro two vectors, you know, you have to go mm -hmm. like 45 degrees apart before you drop like one over square root of, of two, right? And so, and so, so that just is not going to give you, it's too broadly tuned. And so what you can think of the sequence detecting mechanism in the dendrite is that it's way, it gives you that selectivity built in, right? So, so, so first of all, the fact, the idea that you, the right D guys will show up out of mm -hmm. a thousand is already eliminating most of the things, right? And then the fact that, you know, we're just swapping one of those D guys out of water or a few things apart, it doesn't respond. It gives you that selectivity, that the same selectivity you get from the attention and the and the and the um, soft max operation. Okay, and so and so 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 you can you can you do you know there's a more fundamental reason why this is happening and why they went to attention and all this kind of stuff, which has to do mm -hmm. with the recurrent neural network scaling pro poorly because of you know how few net capacity limits. But you know so all this. Is uh, this this dendrite model addresses all that? It, it basically gets rid of the uh, inner product and it's giving me something that's much sharply tuned, and that's the core capability mm -hmm. you're looking for. I see. Yeah, it's kind of like the idea is to like build in the multiplication of query and key, and like do the query key and value comparison and the softmax in the inbuilt into this nano dendritic structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks for summarizing. Yeah, that was a long answer, but it's a long question. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the brief version of the answer. <laughs> we have time for a couple of more questions. So. If that's not the case, we'll uh, thank uh, Kobana again. Okay. Thank you for the great talk, and uh, we'll see you at Telluride, I guess. Yeah, if it's in person, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> it's looking good.
Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks uh, for your for your time and your attention and and for the questions. And oh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, feel free to uh, reach out to me. And when the paper comes out, I'll be sure to send uh, Steve a copy, and anybody else. <laughs> okay. Thank awesome. you for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Take care. Hey. Thanks. Bye. 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 bye.